the Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the 1989 Nobel Peace Prize to the 14th Dalai Lama Tenzin Gyatso, the religious and political leader of the Tibetan people. The committee wants to emphasize the fact that the Dalai Lama, in his struggle for the liberation of Tibet, consistently has opposed the use of violence. He has instead advocated peaceful solutions based upon tolerance and mutual respect in order to preserve the historical and cultural heritage of his people. The Dalai Lama has developed his philosophy of peace from a great reverence for all things living and upon the concept of universal responsibility embracing all mankind as well as nature. In the opinion of the committee, the Dalai Lama has come forward with constructive and forward-looking proposals for the solution of international conflicts, human rights issues, and global, global environment problems. Tenzin Gyatso is a Buddhist monk. His message of compassion, altruism and peace have made him a statesman for our troubled times. For millions of his followers, he is Holy Lord, gentle glory, eloquent, compassionate, learned, defender of the faith, ocean of wisdom. His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. So you see, human life, not very long, and they, you see, human, how to say, their life nature, they bound to happen, you see, problem or suffering. So under that circumstances, the real human value is helping other people remain oneself in peace. That is the real the, uh, val value or, how to say, purpose of one's life. The Dalai Lama is today exiled in India, but to the Tibetans everywhere, he embodies the ideal of the religion he heads and the people he represents. He personifies the history of Tibet. The Dalai Lama is heir to a religious tradition that began here in Bodh Gaya more than 2,500 years ago, when seated under a tree, a young Indian prince, from deep meditation, attained decisive knowledge of the human condition and the unshakable certainty that he was released from its suffering. <laughs> He had become the Buddha, the enlightened one. The core of the Buddhist path is the recognition that life is an endless round of suffering, disease, death and rebirth. A cycle caused by a desire bred of ignorance and of an innate misconception of reality. 
Liberation or enlightenment occurs when through a training of the mind, the mind itself is transcended. There is then an experience of the innate nature of reality, the recognition that all matter exists only in the manner of an illusion and an ultimate voidness. Some beings who have attained enlightenment and thus liberation from rebirth opt for reincarnation voluntarily, out of compassion for others, in order to teach and serve humanity. They are called bodhisattvas. The Dalai Lama is a reincarnation of the patron saint of Tibet, the Buddha aspect of compassion, Avalokiteshvara, a Bodhisattva. Tibetans were confronted by natural grandeur so cruel that it brought an intense awareness of the contrasting splendors and terrors in the universe relieved by a few pleasant plains and a spiritual quest. Spreading across 2,000 miles in the heart of Asia, with India the home of much of its culture in the south, Tibet is a severe Himalayan plateau, 15,000 feet above sea level. In Tibet, the previous Tibet, uh, generally speaking, of course, you see, the happy society, no matter, and the backward society, meantime, Happy. Tibet was a remote secret Shangri-La, so deeply inspired by the Buddhist cosmic view that it pursued its religion in splendid isolation with an unusual fervor. Hunting and killing seized because it meant an arbitrary interruption in that being's own evolution. Armies disbanded and became monks. The traditional kings were replaced by religious rule. The essential peace-loving nature of their religion encouraged a simplicity and a quiet pragmatism in the people. Famine was unknown, disease rare. You see, unfortunately, you see, those monasteries and some, some monasteries, these institutions become, uh, actually, you see, sort of a landlord. Mm -hmm. So not that well. And also the general publics, how to say, the practice of Buddha Dharma. Of course, they... Uh, they, they had great devotion of faith, but actual knowledge is very limited. Meanwhile, China had begun to assert a claim on Tibet, contending that the Tibetan nation was part of the Chinese motherland. In 1933, the great 13 Dalai Lama passed on to the honorable fields. Two years later, Tibet's regent journeyed to its sacred lake, seeking a vision of the one who would be the new leader returned in a new body. In the waters, he was shown a monastery, a nearby house, and a baby. Other Romans directed the search party to the northeast, to the monastery and house of the vision. A two-and-a-half-year-old boy approached and recognized the disguised lamas and called them by name. He spoke in the dialect of the capital Lhasa, over a thousand miles away. He identified as his own the rosaries, walking stick, and hand drum of the 13 Dalai Lama. On the child's body were the marks distinguishing the Dalai Lamas, including the large ears, tiger skin-like streaks on the legs, and the conch shell print on the palm. On a bright October morning in 1939, the now four that this was indeed the Holy One himself, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. And generally speaking, Dalai Lama, the original Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. now, for example, the first Dalai Lama, second, third, now these, uh, I'm no doubt the reincarnation of our look at Shara, so that means uh, Buddha. I, uh, <laughs> I believe, you see, I am a person, uh, the blessed one. At my own, you see, spiritual level, I am not high. I am still, you see, practicing. Holmes included the finest moral philosophy with a vast range of mind development and pioneer psychology. As it traveled the globe, it evolved into religion, advanced philosophy, mysticism, metaphysics, and the triple yogas of India the parts of reason, devotion and action. It was not enough to be told to be moral and ethical. 
Buddhism became an adventure in Hal. The philosopher king born of peasant parents began his long, arduous training while a regent held temporary power. Surrounded by tutors and attendants, he lived in splendid but disciplined isolation. He was soon recognized as an exceptional student. As most of Lhasa watched, His Holiness the Dalai Lama won his doctorate of Buddhist philosophy degree with honors in public debate at the age of 24. On New Year's Day in 1950, still only 16 years old, his education and real politics began. The new People's Republic of China announced its intentions to liberate Tibet. As its armies marched towards a people physically and temperamentally unprepared for war, at the urging of the state oracle and his people, Tenzin Gyatso assumed formal temporal power of Tibet as the 14th Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama, protected by his guards, slowly began his long, dangerous escape into India. Over the next weeks, an estimated 87,000 Tibetans were killed. Twi As a Buddhist, you see, uh, all these tragedy, the basic factor or the cause causes it was is one's own is a previous karma. Now the external, you see, factor is then the Chinese. Forces. But the basic cause is one's own is the previous bad karma. Although you see personally uh, that enemy you see harming on you, but forget that the, the enemy, some so-called enemy, you see that person, you see looking looking at him or she, um, her, you see that also a human being, just like me, who wants happiness. So you see, with that reason, uh, you could develop uh, genuine sympathy or compassion. At the end of the Cultural Revolution, the new Chinese order revealed that less than a hundred of Tibet's 6,000 monasteries had survived. Of the more than 500,000 monks and nuns, a little over a thousand survived in Tibet. These numbers may increase. However, a socialist education is today a prerequisite for permission to enter monkhood. I think you see, Buddhism much emphasis on love and compassion. And you see, Marxism, somehow, you see, they, now for example, they class struggle on the basis of hatred. And also, of course, you see, Buddhism you see, not only thinking this life, but you see, next life also. It was well. an impersonal effect. To live is to act. One accumulates karma based on the motives behind each action. On the afternoon of March 31st, 1959, the Dalai Lama entered India in exile. The Dalai Lama seeking political asylum in India embarrassed its government. Though India and Tibet shared a long religious and cultural history, Prime Minister Nehru was obliged to take into account the then recent delicate rapprochement between India and China. However, humanity triumphed over politics and asylum was granted. 
The Dalai Lama became an honored guest in the land of the Buddha's birth. Though there was profound sympathy and substantial material support for the refugees, there has been little political backing. Tibet's isolation had given it no experience of international diplomacy and few friends. In India, the Dalai Lama plunged into frenetic activity, serving as leader and shock absorber to a traumatized people uprooted from their natural habitat into the heat and different conditions of India. They not only survived change but flourished, drawing upon a philosophy that provided important insights into the permanent nature of change and flux, of how becoming is a vital aspect of being. The Dalai Lama found residence in Dharamsala, a day from Delhi. An area of less than two acres, out of the graciousness of a foreign government, was now the Dalai Lama's physical domain. He was shown of the external symbols that attested to his power and authority in Tibet. It was a call to Tenzin Gyatso to build a much vaster empire sourced on an inner kingdom. For the Dalai Lama, the cultivation of inner peace and a refined integrity are the ultimate weapons that an individual can use to make a difference in the seemingly mad world. While the world soon prepared to put Tibet back on the shelves of myth and legend, the Dalai Lama and his people were driven by a different perception of reality. Religion was their wellspring and it had top priority. Preserving and as it evolved perpetuating Tibetan religion and culture became an essential strategy in exile and countered Chinese attempts to decimate it. The Tibetan identity would not be allowed to die. For every major monastery that had been destroyed in Tibet, a new if smaller one was built in India, continuing the same lineage and practices as in Tibet. Children, the hope of any exiled people continued to ordain as monks and senior lamas now began to reincarnate in exile. Because I am outside Tibet, so still, you see, the pure form of Tibetan culture or Tibetan, you see, uh, you see yes, culture, or oh, it's still there. Mm. Now today, as I say, surprisingly or say, strangely, the true Tibetan culture or Tibetan, you see, community uh, find outside Tibet, not inside. The major challenge was rehabilitation. By the early 1980s, 44 Tibetan settlements linked by commercial, political and religious ties housed almost all the 100,000 exiles who looked at Dharamsala as their headquarters. The refugees arrived with few assets and little immunity to the many diseases unknown in Tibet's dry atmosphere, but prevalent in subtropical India. Slowly the survivors began to weave a small economic miracle. Their former feudal lives were quickly relinquished. The barren land was equitably distributed and a marketing and purchasing collective established. Tibetan medicine, Tibetan crafts and arts, and Tibetan education were encouraged. The Tibetans in exile have carved out one of the most successful stories of the rehabilitation of a people, of vigorously maintaining their own identities, yet harmonizing with their new environments to remain welcome by their hosts.
The Dalai Lama's keen personal interest in the modernization of a medieval social system has been rewarded in the emergence of a new generation of Tibetans fiercely loyal to their cause. The first children to see maps of the world and hear about people other than their own. The Dalai Lama has evolved a profound commitment to pacifism and non-violence that has been reinforced by an exposure to the philosophy of Gandhi. With the small administrative structure that he evolved in Dharamsala, a government in exile that no one has recognized, he has managed to refocus international attention on the predicament of his people. His emphasis on the interconnectedness of all things has helped generate a new sensitivity to the significance of our environment and the real potential for a truly secular inter-religious dialogue. Tibet's cause is never far from the pilgrims' thoughts. Each day's teachings conclude with prayers for their brethren who still suffer, followed by a dedication of the merit gain to the speedy end of their suffering. Today there is renewed hope, a Nobel Peace Prize that reflects a measure of consensus in international public opinion in support of both his cause and the strategy he embodies. Thirty years later, the US Congress, the European Parliament, and numerous groups across the political spectrum have articulated their concern over human rights violations, the threat to the environment in Tibet, and the future of its people. The Chinese government have protested the Nobel Peace Prize as an interference in their internal affairs. <laughs> the Dalai Lama believes that it is only by building up a collective merit of good karma through overcoming their own delusions, can the situation resolve itself favorably. By their rough actions, masses of cruel ones are bringing down ruin on themselves and on others. They are drunk with demonic delusions. Forge the glorious unity of friendship among them, these objects of compassion, and with love and mercy help them acquire the wisdom eye to see what is right and what is wrong. essential teaching of you see Buddha Dharma that is the Buddhichitta or the Buddhichitta means a sort of you see firm determination to achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of others you see that uh, on the basis of Karuna and Maitri I'm developing this in their mind the last I think now 30 years effort now somehow I'm gaining this experience then the other one is the wisdom which is understand Shunya the Sanskrit word shunyata, you see, voidness or emptiness sometimes. So, you see, understanding about, you see, that also, you see, some, I mean, gaining experience. You see, without training, even you cannot utilize, you see, your finger properly. Once you train uh, properly, then small, small things with, you see, very big uh, uh, finger can handle very well. Human mind as such, uh, at, without training, feels, seems very difficult, almost impossible. But through, you see, uh, gradual training, step by step, 
you can you can do these things. So that is one of the um, one of the good quality of human consciousness. Sometimes human con- generally human consciousness is very um, I mean creative and also sometimes troublemaker. But if you train properly, that will be uh, very nice and very useful, like a j- real jewel. <laughs> By visualizing the different states of awareness and manifestations, the student gains a deeper insight and understanding of himself and his practice. To a mind thus cultivated, the precision and logic of modern science and technology holds out a strong attraction. A passion since childhood, when the adolescent Dalai Lama took apart watches, film projectors and Tibet's three cars, he is an expert and enjoys tinkering with mechanical things. Now you see scientific research, very important. Since you see general Buddhist I mean, idea or attitude is, you see, we must accept reason or the, uh, the fact. Uh, if a certain thing which actually we believe, but that not proved by fact or something to the contrary, then we must uh, accept the fact rather than the uh, certain thing which described in, the, uh, in this uh, scripture. So now, for example, the Buddha himself, this is very clearly mentioned, the, you must accept certain thing through your own investigation. You see, your own, how to say, using logics and reasons, not the out of devote or faith. A question is asked about the importance of giving up smoking. Generally speaking, you see, forbid, better to stop. Now, in case, you see, some individual, unless you have like this, huh? you see, you are not going to work well. Huh? Yeah. So now, you see, sincere motivation in order to uh, practice you see, better in, you see, in particular that day. With, uh, so, you see, solely that motivation, I think one or two <laughs> secrets may be all right, I think. <laughs> so, you see, the main, main point is we have to look the, you see, result or the value. The Dalai Lama is a frequent guest and speaker in the country of his exile. People are drawn to his infectious personality in which life, living and joy have a unique vitality. His philosophy of optimism and hope in a life of frequent personal trials has a quality of surrender where there is no grasping or clinging to the fruits of his actions. Yet there is a vitality to his every gesture. I think human quality, uh, human mind, the most precious and I think you surprise less as genuine love, compassion. I think, you see, the entire human society, uh, I think, you see, uh, live on that, on that point, on that, how to say, on that, on that thing. Without love, without compassion, uh, entire humanity cannot survive. Tibet today is at once a tragedy and a triumph, a stark example of modern totalitarianism fighting to a draw against an unwilling traditional society. A number of delegations have visited Tibet from Dharamsala, evoking powerful emotions. 
Following the death of Mao, delicate contacts were established between the Dalai Lama and Beijing. The Dalai Lama proposed a five-point peace plan. This was followed by an offer renouncing Tibetan independence and any political role for himself in the Tibet of the future. With the events in Tiananmen Square in May 1989, and with the continuation of martial law in the Tibetan capital Lhasa from March 1989, there are no reported contacts at the present time. The Chinese government have accused the Dalai Lama of instigating anti-Chinese and anti-national sentiment. The institution of the Dalai Lama is something, uh, um, symbol or figure, not only for Tibetan Buddhism, but Buddhism as a whole. So in the future, if the circumstances are such that institution of the Dalai Lama is something uh, must be continued, something useful, might be advisable to change, not on the basis of, you see, reincarnation, but on the basis of selecting those who already, you see, uh, reach certain age and really qualified in the Dharma practice as well as the knowledge. The Dalai Lama's role as a preeminent Buddhist monk is today almost universally acknowledged amongst the different schools of Buddhism. While the battle between Marxist materialism and Buddhist spiritualism, between the power of the gun and the power of wisdom and compassion now simmers, the Dalai Lama himself reaches out to a world increasingly responsive to his personality, teaching and message, if not to his political cause. Because there are so many different, what do you call, mental disposition in the human brain. So one religion may not be suitable for everyone. Now under that circumstances, one thing we should keep in our mind is, you see, closer relation. Now, you see, closer understand. Then it, it will develop mutual respect. Your Holiness, there is no adequate way to thank you for the honor you have done for us in coming here to stay with us. And not only for that, but for the great happiness and even enjoyment you have given us by the way in which you have uh, spoken to everyone and made yourself so agreeable. Now, I would like to give you just a token present as a memory, and here is a specially bound volume of a translation of the life of St. Benedict by St. Gregory, which was translated by one of our monks some years ago. It's quite simple English. And it went... <laughs> so suitable for me. <laughs> and this I think you will recognize. <laughs> For tea. <laughs> this, tea, uh, huh? In 1960, uh, a friend of mine was in the Himalayas and met a Tibetan refugee from whom he bought this. So it comes from Tibet. In fact, he said it came from Lhasa. He gave it to me and it has remained here ever since. <laughs> And now I think it should go back. <laughs> the Dalai Lama has not sought one common faith for all people. He has instead reached out to the common ground of all religions, the quest for happiness. Buddhism, never a missionary religion, is carried on his smiling face. If someone believes certain ideology, he feel, he or she feel that is something best means to achieve happiness and his right. Pursue is it that thing. The other person, the different ideology or different faith some, seems to be suitable, they follow that. Not interfere to each other, but understand both are human beings a member of human family, both are 
uh, want happiness, do not want suffering, and both have the right to be happy. Now, under that circumstances, remain as a brother, as a brother sisters. Now, that is my dream. Lord.